Alex, you and I go way back to RISD freshman year, and we'll get into that in a minute. But you've been working now as a freelance illustrator for several years. You've done work for clients like Adobe, Apple, Google, MTV, New York Times, Baskin Robbins, and we'll get a chance to look at a lot of work from those clients in a minute. But let's go way back to RISD freshman year. I believe I was your first drawing teacher in the fall semester. So you have to tell everybody our how we met story. Yeah, I mean, you're literally the second class, I believe. I had like one teacher and then the next day was you. So it's like second day of RISD, I had you and also met one of my best friends in this class. And yeah, I remember exactly what you said the first day. You said, you're allowed to play music. I hate opera music. You can, but don't, don't ever play that. And I don't want to listen to Broadway music. And also, if you're late, if you're one minute late, I'm going to, I'm not going to even critique you. So you're like, you're notorious for being tough, but it was tough love. And it was like, um, you, yeah, a lot of people knew you by name because they were like, oh, you got Clara, what? Anyways, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to try to like, not trying to raise you up or anything, knock you down a bit. Well, and actually we ended up working together at RISD because you were my teaching assistant for yeah. a summer class and also a freshman drawing class. And I remember you were the student, you said to me, being in your class is like having Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's pretty, I put it in as my, my quote on my yearbook. So I, I would say that's accurate. What did you say? Yeah, I mean, if I put it as my quote, it's definitely accurate to me. I was like, I was like, I'm like, she was so mean to me. But no, you were actually really nice. It was just, it was tough love. Like the whole class. Oh, cry me a river. <laughs> you know what you're like? Apparently Bob Ross was apparently really tough because he was like a like an army marine. And then he started doing painting and everybody just thinks of him as like really nice. You're like the same thing. Like people are probably like, oh, Clara's just so nice. And they're like, you didn't know her back in college. She was so tough. <laughs> anyway, you ended up majoring in illustration at RISD. And let's talk a little bit about your senior year. Did you know at that point that you wanted to do freelance illustration? Ooh, um, senior year was like kind of definitely this like weird period where I didn't, I wanted to do freelance and I had um, a teacher, Chris Bazzelli, who told me and he was like, you have to be really proactive to be a freelancer. And he, he kind of was actually a little bit open. He's like, I don't know if you you could do it. And I honestly didn't really pursue it, pers like go for it at first. I actually went for a, like a salary kind of job being an in-house illustrator. But then um, I decided like later on after, you know, I started getting some requests for clients that I, I decided to make that leap into freelance, but it was definitely like a little scary and I was not really planning on doing it. Well, what do you think is the hardest thing about starting a freelance career? Uh, I mean, obviously it's like getting clients. It's like, how do you like go right to, you know, starting freelance and just kind of like, okay, I hope people come to me and like, you know, get that attention. And, uh, and it's also just like, and honestly, it's like the budget. Like some people are like, oh, I saved $5,000. I can start doing freelance. And you're like, $5,000 is going to burn through quickly. And like a lot of people, it takes like years to feel like they got like a financial grasp on it, not to scare anybody away. It's just like, it is ton of, it definitely kind of has its hustle to it. For sure. And freelance is not something you can just start. You have to build it gradually over time. And for a lot of people, it takes several years to build that client list and to get that trust. All right. So what did you do right after graduation? Did you move to New York City? I know you're in New York City now. Yeah. So actually it was... Um... It was senior year. I like had no money. I had six hundred dollars in my bank account. I was still living just right off campus, and um, my girlfriend at the time like moved to Portland because she started working at Leica, and I was kind of like left with six hundred dollars in my bank account and not know what I was doing with my life. So I decided to actually get a. I applied for a job and I got an internship at this like little company called Marco Polo, um, which was like a children's app company, and they. I didn't, I didn't actually realize it was an internship until I got hired. I thought it was like a real job, but they like paid me like minimum wage. And I was like 
really it was like 10 bucks an hour in New York city and like not being able to afford food. And it was like real, it was like not a fun experience and not financially until they finally hired me. Um, and then I was actually like the salary man. I was like, Oh, I got an actual paycheck. And that's how I was able to save money from that. I was able to save money and build up so that when I did want to make my leap to freelance, I at least did have some money saved up to, you know, not worry. Dara is saying, did you wet your pants a lot or a little going freelance full-time unexpectedly? Ooh, uh, I, I was fortunate. Like um, I had, um, like I said, I had some, I did have some budget, but it did, I did have some nights where I was like, oh my God, did I make the right choice? Like you kind of feel it's like you don't have a safety net and that's what's scary. It's like, you feel like your whole life you have like that safety net or sorry, when you have a job, you have that safety net. You're like, at least like, as long as I go to my nine to five and I don't get fired, I'm going to like still get a paycheck coming in. But it's, this is like, you don't know when your job's going to come, when your next job is coming in. And you have little bills of like, of like health insurance, which is like $537 and then rent, which is like a thousand one hundred dollars and then like taxes and all this other stuff. And you're just like, Oh my God, like I have to like save money for taxes. And that like some, I had some restless lights in the beginning. Um, it was definitely very, very stressful. And I know social media actually played a pretty significant role for you at the beginning of your career. And I'll tell you, five years ago, I was like, ah, social media, whatever. But I feel like now it really is getting people bona fide work. And for yeah. you, there is a big moment because you actually did this illustration, which changed your whole Instagram presence. Tell us what happened with this illustration. Yeah. Um... So I was like, I was hitting like a thousand followers and I was like, oh, you know what? I'm really getting into this. I'm like, oh, I just want to get like a bunch. I was at a time when I just wanted to get followers. So I was like, okay, let's think like, let's actively think about like what makes, gets you followers. And I was like, I, I, I know you people like this picture. I don't, but it's for this, this reason. And I was like, it's like, okay, I know like cute things and like cats and like, you know, getting like um, big eyes that are very visible on small icons because you're in the explore tab and like all this other stuff. Um, and then juxtaposing that with like, you know, this jelly eye with like these. And and then essentially I, I like took like another person's picture of a cat and drew it. And then I said in the comments, and this is what actually got me like a bunch of, this is what happened is like I said, does anybody know whose cat this is? And everybody was tagged that photographer who is like this Korean cat lady who's like got a million some followers. And then she's, cause everybody was tagging her. She saw it, she reposted it, which brought traffic back to my Instagram page from her million followers. And then that, so I woke up to like 8,000 likes. And because I had 8,000 likes from just waking up the next morning, I like, I became trending as like number one on the art page of Instagram, which then gave me about like 3,000 or 4,000 followers within about a week's time. And that's like, just like, it just like bumped me up from that. I was like, oh, wow. Like just this single picture. And I was like, I could maybe keep doing this, but I also kind of felt like I was selling my soul. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to do another one, <laughs> but it's cute. It is but cute. I know a lot of people that like my cat picture. It did lead to bona fide clients. This was not just a bunch of likes. It actually yeah. became something with visible results. So what started happening in terms of those visible results? Well, I know one client that like really liked it was that got me a job, which is um, the really famous company, uh, No Brow, No Brow Press, which um, if people in the illustration community really know and they really respect that publishing house. And they said specifically they, they hired me because they really loved my cat and they wanted to make a book just like on my cat alone. And people are like, wow, that's like not only like a children's book place wants to like make a book just on that like concept of your illustration, but they it's like No Brow of all places. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, there were some jobs, like because of these followers I was getting in, I was getting like, you know, people like followers from like art directors and people, and I would get emails being like, Hey, I really like your artwork. Um, and I would love to hire you for a project. And that's kind of how Instagram works in most cases. Neftali says, this is for Alex. How many places can illustrators work in? I'm studying speech pathology, but I want to combine it with illustration. That's a great Ooh. question. Ooh, can, wait, what is, what is speech pathology? Can, 
Can you type that real quick? I don't know, you can't well, type it maybe, really. maybe Neftali, you can explain in the comments what speech pathology is. But I think the basic question is, can you do a freelance career and something else at the same time? Or do you really have yeah. to go 100% in? No, no, no. Most people actually do combine it with other things. Uh, I wouldn't say it's like necessarily speech pathology, but that's really awesome. And I actually think people who are more further apart and can combine those two, they make the most interesting art in general because uh, they have such diverse knowledge and things. But um, most people I know, actually, they could do like full time as like, say, a graphic designer for like a publishing house. And then they do freelance on the sides, spe like specifically New York Times or sorry, um, editorial. So you, they might work for like New York Times or something because that, you know, you can just work, you know, in the evenings and, you know, get your reputation as a freelancer through that way. Alex, let's take a look at this animated illustration because you do a lot of pieces that are almost like short film. So I'll just play this while we're talking about it. Can you just tell us what's your process? Like what software do you use to Whoa. make this? Well, <laughs> that is, I mean, it's not, this is not a good example of like software because this is actually my first like animation I ever made for a client. This is like my first client ever, which is Baskin Robbins. And they asked me to make like looping animations and I didn't know how to necessarily do that. So I did everything in like Illustrator and Photoshop. And then when they want it, and it was like, I spent like day and night trying to complete it. But if I did it nowadays, I could probably do it within like a few hours. But it was like, then I was like spending day and night trying to get it done. And then they were like, okay, can we like have some changes on it? And I was like, changes? Like what? That's like a thing? Like. They're like, and I was like, oh no, like this is going to be like so bad. I, I like told them, I was like, I honestly don't know how to change it. And they were like, oh, well, we'll just have to do it in house then. I, we were hoping you could do it. It's like, oh no. But that's like, uh, it's like first job. It's like, whatever. Neil is asking, I'm still in high school. Should I worry about this stuff? Instagram still kind of scares me. Well, like what advice would you give if you're a young art school student and you want to build your Instagram presence? Is that really important or do people need to not worry about that? Well, when you're in high school, no. I actually think it's probably best not to. I think specifically in high school, it's just like, that's, it's, it's like a very rough time in general and i just think like trying to rely on you, you especially in high school you, like from my experience it's like you're kind of more relying on your self-identity with other people and you're just kind of like i want to get likes i want to probably get follows and it's just kind of like you might rely too much on it and honestly it's like you you're also probably expected to have a style and we can talk about this later but really in high school and college you shouldn't have a. it's good to not have a style evolved quite yet Instead, that should be something that maybe you can hopefully come on later in life um, be, through your experience, because you might pigeonhole yourself to have a, if you have a style early on. And you might be like, well, this is what I have to do and I can't explore anything else. This is what I do. So I think it's good to just like, you know, just do you for the time being and then maybe later on build it up. But So let's take a look at, here's another animation from Baskin Robbins. Can you tell us where they put this? Was this, Oh. in their website or where did this actually go oh. because that context is so important for illustration so they want they gave me some prompts and they were like and there was like some of them was like yeah like a cloud throwing up sprinkles or like i don't remember the other ones like a neon light with prayer hands or something and this one was like an ice cream cone twerking so i was like oh i'm picking that one and then that was like one of the ones where they like asked for a change and i didn't know how to change it so they did that in house and the actual advertisement, I don't think I linked it because it honestly disturbs me. But they animated where the ice cream cone was not very like a like just a happy twerk. It was like a vicious, like staring into your souls, like, yeah, you like jiggling the butt really bouncing them. He's like, Yeah, this is great, right? And you're just like, oh god, no, what? And people in the comments on YouTube were like, this is a thing of nightmares. <laughs> like everybody's comment was like, I hate this so much. And I was like, no. <laughs> It was like, it was, it was super funny, but I took it out of, I think I took it off my website. It might be on there, but um, I think I took it off my website because I was like, yeah, it's probably, it's a little too intense, we'll just say. Well, I'm curious, do you get a lot of response in terms of when you have an illustration published or do you just sort of do the illustration and it goes off into the magazine and that's sort of the end? Do you get feedback from the audience? 
Uh, what do you, when you say feedback from the audience, do you mean like somebody sees it in the newspaper and they come to me or is, is that yeah. what you mean? Uh, rarely it does happen. Some people do like send me an email being like, I've had a few nice emails, like some really random people being like, I just read this article and I just wanted to say, I really love your illustration. And that's it. That's all I just wanted to say. And I'm like, Oh, well, that's really nice. Um, but I do like I do get a fluctuation. Like I get like people that way might like come onto my Instagram and follow me, or they might be other art directors that might save my website because they saw my work from another client. Though that's how like that's how you kind of expand in the freelance world. Is like you work on really cool projects, and people go like, "Oh, I just saw this project on my feed from, and that was you, and I follow you, and blah blah blah." Would you say that? In the illustration world, everybody knows each other. It's a little clubhouse type of thing. Or is it bigger than that? Because I do think that in a lot of art circles, it does feel like this little clubhouse where everybody hangs out. Yeah, it can. it's kind of both. It's like, it's kind of clubhouse where it's like, yeah, you, but here's the thing is that they're very open. And if you want to talk to like a freelance illustrator and somebody that you really admire, I'm going to say like, there's a good chance that they'll, like if you give them a genuine question and want to talk to you, like they'll spend the time and talk to you and you'll, and then just, you can form a connection like that. Um, but it is like, I, we, we do kind of be like, yeah, you kind of do know a lot of each other. And that's just kind of the natural situation of working in freelance. Like sometimes you go like, Oh, I really admire this one illustrator that might be a generation older than me. And they have like their own, like almost like it's like their own group of like illustrators that they have. But it's like, in the end, it's like you, you kind of create your own group from your own generation and era and you still group and you can, you hang out and you still network and you still talk to everybody um, from like from all around. It's, it's really nice though. Uh, but well, how do you meet the art directors? Do you send them a cold call email? Oh. Do tap? Like how does that actually happen? Because I think that's the part of the process that people truly just don't know how to go about. Yeah. I mean, I know that there is that book, isn't it called like Children's Society Writers Market, something like that? And there's like uh, names of art directors in there. I but a, oh, I literally have a book. I don't know if you can see it in there, but I do have a book that's called Price. That, I think that's actually just for pricing, but it's, it's talking about like freelance work. But um, no, I actually, so I did gave somebody a portfolio review and I said like, and I showed her how you can find like a client's email and do a cold email within, and it only takes about three minutes to find all the information. It's like pro stocking. You like essentially, for example, you can go onto like the New York Times website, find an, illust an illustration you like from one of the articles, find that artist's name, go on their Instagram. The, in the person on Instagram will most likely say, oh, here's an article I, or illustration I did for an article. Thank you, art director at blah, 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 blah. So they literally said the art director's name. You find that art director, you do another Google search of that person, find their website, you find their email. And it's like, essentially it's like you can create an Excel worksheet, ex ex like sheet and then you just like essentially do like cold emails where you say like i saw like hey blah 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 like hi john doe like i saw your work like uh with this one artist and i really love both of like i love like how you collaborated i'd love to like also work with you one day blah 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 and then send them an email and you can send out like mass emails so a lot of freelancers do that where they send out mass emails and they get their collection of art directors emails um and essentially, like, yeah, if you find, like, say if you find one format for, like, New York Times and be like, oh, this is, like, how their emails format formatted, as long as you find, know that format, you can apply it to everybody. So you'd be like, oh, so it's john.doe at the New York Times. And you go, oh, then it must be jane.doe at New York Times. And you can essentially just, you just do that. You just go, like, oh, now that they may not give their New York Times, like, email, but I can now use that format and just you know, just be logical about it. And now I know their email because it's all the same. So yeah, it's like, it's like being smart about like stalking and giving Jenny. I've done the exact same thing with journalists because you just have to find one person's email and then you reformat everybody else and you're good yeah, to go. You, yeah, you did it for like, you did some stuff for Huffington Post, I believe, right? It was- I did. Well, I used to blog for Huffington Post, but lately I've been stalking a lot of journalists and you you can find stuff if you are smart about it. So, and like yeah. I said, it takes like three minutes to just find an art director. It's like, you guys can try it. Go on to like, the, go on to like whatever publication you like. Go and just like find an illustration you like, find that illustrator, go to their Instagram or Twitter, find who they, find an illustration that 
you know, that tags that art director, find that art director, reverse stock them, find their website. And it's just like, it's actually really easy. Um, so you can, yeah, you just can build an Excel worksheet that just has like 400 people, like 400 contacts and be like, here's their email, here's their phone number, how you like recognize their work. And then you can type up your, your cold emails and send it out to them and just be polite and genuine, you know? All right, let's take a look at this really quick clip, which is from something you did for MTV. So is yeah. this the same technique as you did when you were doing the Baskin Robbins illustration? Oh. Or have you now switched to different software? Oh, no, that's totally, yeah, that one's, so the Baskin Robbins one is like all Photoshop and it's like technically it's cell animation, but um, that of uh, the one from MTV is all CGI. And I use a program called Cinema 4D. And essentially it was because I was using it for a product with Google and I ended up having to use it. So I had to learn it within a few weeks. And, and then after Google, I was like super into CGI for a quick bet that I decided to like do a whole animation for MTV. I had, I, I didn't know how, they were, I wanted me to do a 15 second ad and I had no idea how to do a 15 second ad. I was like, I don't really like animate like large things. I just kind of do like fun little gifts. So let's just figure this out. I don't know. I'll just do it in CGI. I've never really done a big CGI thing like this. So I hope they like it. And they did. But wait so a second. Like, did, did you teach yourself Cinema 4D or did you know that know. from school? No, no, no. I never learned it from school. I just taught, I, it took me like, I so I had to, to when I got my big, like when I worked at Marco Polo, I quit because I got a really big job for Google and it was like a massive residency job. Um, and they said, I, this is where you have to say like what a scope is in a project, but essentially I didn't tell them that I would be doing the CGI and they just assumed I would. So they didn't put in the budget. So then when they were like, come to the CGI part, they were like, oh, Alex, we're gonna do CGI, right? And I was like, I, I don't know how to do CGI. I just paint. And they're like, oh, we thought your work was CGI. So then I had to be like, uh, you know what? I, I can just like figure it out. So I downloaded, I got the program. It took me like two weeks and um, to like figure it out. It's like a little bit more difficult than Photoshop, but it's Cinema 4D is like a really intuitive CGI program. And then like they imported it into a program called Unreal Engine, which is for, you know, making games and stuff like that. And they made an interactive VR simulation with my CGI work. But because yeah, that I had to learn on the job. For Google, I was like, I don't, I'm, yeah, I, I can do this, and it, it definitely doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. Like the final result, I'm like, oh man, that looks like that's some rough CGI. That's like bad. But you know, well, Alex, whatever. that reminds me of the time that they asked me to teach a class at RISD on linear perspective, and I agreed, but I had never done linear perspective before. So I was like, okay, I guess I've got some summer homework. So you're not the only one <laughs> like that. Yeah, All right, that we have was... a question from Dara who says, how many tech skills did you enter the market with and how many did you have to learn to stay relevant and hireable? Great question. Hmm. Um, how many tech skills did you enter? Well, for example, it's just like, so there's a thing called a pipeline and essentially a pipeline is like when a company, a studio hires you, they like want to know that you can essentially work like a gear in a cog, like a cog in like a clockwork. And so that's like a pipeline. You have to be able to know like a certain program to pass on to the next person for the next step. So for example, like Photoshop is industry standard and that's like a program that I might use. Um, and that's like what is expected to know. But Cinema 4D is like, I just, taught my, I just, because I just kept doing it, people, I guess some clients were kind of impressed that I could combine it. And they like, did kind of like to hire me to be able to do both in some ways. Um, most of the time, I think people like, like me for my painting stuff though, um, in Photoshop. And then they just kind of go like, we'll figure out how to make it in some sort of way. Just like, we just want like your style in it. We'll just figure out how to, it will be animated. We'll, we don't know how it will be done, but we'll figure it out, which is, <laughs> I'm like, okay, good luck on that. I don't know how to do it either. So, but that's always that's always what they say. They just like they just want to figure. They just want to make it look like my illustration, and then they'll figure out how to animate it. Dark Bulb is saying, "What resources did you have to learn CGI?" Yeah, I mean, did you take like an online class? Did you just look at YouTube? How did you actually learn yeah. the software? Yeah, just YouTube videos. Those ones where it's like some guy speaking Russian and he's just like, you just kind of, it's like eight minutes long and it has like 
like half of its dislikes because the audio is really bad. And you're just like sitting there going like, yeah, this is just how I learn. It's that's why I said, fortunately the program is very intuitive. It's like, it's like, oh, cube. Oh, there's literally a button for cube. I made a cube. Oh, cool. Oh, I can make a light. There's a button for light. And I guess I can just grab it and move it around. Um, actually, Claire's husband taught Maya, and Maya is like a is that's another CGI program that's used with like it's also industry standard, but it's more for character animation, and it is difficult. So I when I had his class, I thought that all CGI was like that, and I was like, this is terrible. And then I learned Cinema 4D, and I was like, oh wait, this is like really easy. It's like not, it's not actually that bad. So that's why I was shocked when I saw you doing all this. I'm like, I thought you told me you were not into CGI, and it's like a total 360. Yeah, your your it? husband, your husband made me not like CGI. What can I say? <laughs> he was he. <laughs> he was, I was just like, this is everybody who does my. It's like one of the more difficult programs to learn. So that's what, and it was like not something to go in like without any knowledge about it. So I was like, oh, this is rough. I don't know how to do this at all. And then it's like. Cinema 4D is just like, like I said, it's like click of the buttons. So and you're just like, oh, look at it. Now it's rendered. It's be it's be beautiful. Raphael is saying, have you ever turned down a job? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's very common I have to turn down jobs because you might be. So for example, um, for jobs that are like on day rates, you can't take another job because they're essentially you're saying, I'm giving you my service for that day. And they might be like, hey, can we put you on a hold, like a booking hold? And essentially I give them that promise. I won't take another job for that amount of time uh, that they have me on hold, even though the job, so it might be hold for like a month, but the job might be for only a week long. And I have to say like, I won't take any job within that month because you might need me. And then essentially that's the thing is that all these jobs always come at the same time. It's like the annoying thing. They all come at the same day. It's like five jobs, like all within that same week, they all come and they're just like, we need, we want to hire you, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm just like, I can't, I, I just took this. I put myself on a month long hold. So there's like a thing called first holds and second holds where essentially first holds is like your first promise. And then second holds is like, it's like, if I don't get this, this one and I can negotiate with them, you'll be my second choice essentially. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it definitely turned on lots of jobs and some really good ones. Like I turned on Facebook and Nike for like some, some of them. And I was just like, Oh no. Like, especially when I was starting off, I was like, Oh no, this is like the biggest jobs I'll ever have. And I don't ever get, and I was like, okay. Nowadays, you, well, a you, lot of freelancers tell me that oftentimes it's feast or famine. So how do you deal yeah. with that? The lack of predictability is so hard. I mean, how have <sighs> you managed that? Yeah, that's like, that's, um, uh, luckily coronavirus coming around and taxes are delayed until you get a good job. And then, yeah, it's just like, you're just kind of like, I, for a long period of time, it's like being on the edge and you're just like, oh man, like, I don't know if I can pay my month's rent this month. And then it took, but that's the thing is like, that was in the beginning. Now I feel a lot better now. Um, but it definitely took a while. I will say that I'm not a very good example because as I said, I'm not very proactive in trying to get clients. I kind of just, re I'm pretty bad in the sense that I let them come to me, but people who are very proactive can like do quite well. And they can like, if there is, as long as you do like cold emails and, you know, stuff like that, you know, sending their PDFs to work or like Google slide links of your, your work to clients and being like, I'd love to work with you. Let me know if there's a job, here's my availability. You know, so that's, it's a little different for other people though. Tom is asking, how complicated is taxes, social security, health insurance, contracts, and accounting issues as a freelancer? Do you do all of that yourself? No, I actually can't because um, my family, there's like, my family has some things where it's like, we, we, our taxes are just too complicated because of some things that, you know, property and some stocks. So essentially like, I just can't do it myself. Um, but yeah, you good thing is like you should write everything off that you can. Otherwise, you know, you're gonna be getting like a giant, you're gonna realize you're gonna be also like owing a lot. You can write off a lot of things as long as it's legal, you know, be good about it. Don't yeah. Yeah, that, that's a little bit important. <laughs> it's important to say. I have some friends who are just like, oh, I just write off everything. And I'm just like, is that like, but can you do that? And they're like, nobody checks. 
as long as you don't get audited. And I was like, oh, okay. My family plays on the safe side. We They're like, no, write things off, but like, no, as long as it's like appropriate to the government. Yeah, of course. Well, let's talk about these logistics because I'll tell you, whenever I do lectures, I have to hunt people down to get paid. Like these people that hire you, they do not keep track. Like I actually emailed somebody this week. I said, listen, it's been three months. I have not been paid. They're like, oh, we just need an invoice. And I'm like, it didn't occur to you to tell me that three months ago. I mean, what do you do with that when you have these clients that are just a big pain in terms of getting paid? Yeah, well, you can. Um, I haven't done this, but I did hear of uh, uh, one thing that you can do. So on your, because you do send your invoices out. And then what you can say is a thing called net 30. And essentially net 30 means is that you have to be paid within those 30 days after receiving that invoice. Otherwise, they'll take, you put on essentially a, a fee as like an artist, you can be like, oh no, you owe me more money because you you delayed it. Uh, I haven't done it. I don't know people who have done it. I have per- heard of people that said that they put on like a net 30 thing, unless it's like, I don't know, 5% fee or whatever, I don't know. But then they um, essentially what you do, yeah, I've had some clients where they don't pay me for like four months. Um, I'm not gonna say their names, but uh, let's just say one of them was famous in the news just in March because of, <laughs> because they were notorious for Bon Appetit. So yeah, I've already just said the name, but they they the magazine was really nice. It's not their fault. I like the art director. Just want to say that <laughs> if she sees us and be like, no, 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 you're great. <laughs> Hemi Bonilla is saying, I'm an illustrator, but I don't know how to sell my style. So how do you do that, Alex? How do you have to? find people that publish illustrations that look like yours? Do you just do cold calls and hope somebody bites? How do you sell your style? Sell your style? I So, I mean, I guess like as an illustrator, you think of your, some people think of themselves as like a brand and don't, don't get intimidated by that word. Brand is like, it's not like super corporate and, but it's like brand is just like kind of like, yeah, like having that style and like, an art director might want to hire you because they know that what you're going to produce is almost like, it's like they can, they know what you're going to make and they're not going to be unpredictable with like whatever you're going to make. And, uh, and a lot of times they they want to hire you for their style. Um, I don't know what, like, what do you mean by like selling it though? Like how do you, how to sell your style? It, Cause it's like, sounds like, like, are you just saying like, Oh, have a cool style and then you'll get clients. Like, what is, what do you mean by that? Like, I, I would say, I mean, Hemi, you can tell us in the chat, but I would say, how do you know who to approach? Because there's so many magazines and mm. publications out there. You have to whittle it down. And so do you look at the illustrations and say the New Yorker and say, oh, they like this type of stuff. I think I'm going to make that. Or do you have your own style and then try to match the magazine to yourself? Like, Because a lot of magazines have a certain look for their illustrations. Yeah, I personally would say to a degree, just make your own work and then try to find something that more matches to it. Like you don't really want to like try to put yourself into a situation where you're just trying to like, you're like, oh, everybody's like really into gradients right now. I'm gonna, I guess I should make things that are like gradients. And that's like a trend right now. And it's like, you should not do that. Art directors don't actually care as much for that like it's like a little percentage that they might like be like oh yeah it looks cool maybe because it's like in style right now but for the most part it's like they really like originality and they do like people who are like very confident in what they do and might be not as they might not have seen it before um so i just think like you just shouldn't try to follow exactly like what other people are trying to do and thinking like oh this is what the client wants so i guess i'm just gonna try to like make my art look like what the client but then that's where I said, like, but, you know, to a degree, don't also just, like, be total opposite and be like, oh, they really seem to like corporate friendly children's books. But I like to draw creepy, like, creepy monster creatures that are, like, from what's it, scary stories to tell in the dark kind of stuff. It's like, you know, have a degree of, like, knowing, like, what your client is into. Neftali is saying, do you need to do digital to work in freelance or can you get by with just doing traditional? Oh yeah, you can just do traditional, of course. Nobody, honestly, like you can find like people doing like, for example, illustration, people think, oh, if you, if you don't have an experience with illustration, you might be like, oh, illustration is just like flat design that you see in magazines or it's children book. 
or it's like working for DreamWorks. But honestly, it's like illustration is like everything. It's like you can do sculpture and photograph it and then, you know, give it to clients or, you know, installations. It's actually very broad. So it's like, I would say that traditional, there's a lot of, it is a lot more probably time consuming work in some ways and maybe making edits might be a bit of a pain, but there's a lot of illustrators that do traditional medium. I'd say it's pretty half and half, honestly. It's like, yeah, digital, or or uh, traditional. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about your actual process, Alex. So we're gonna actually show this clip of your Pinterest board. So tell us how this plays into your process. Yeah, um, definitely like if I'm, for example, if I'm having like kind of a slow period, okay, first I'll just say that like, it's good to just have like something to have as inspiration and references and I just love Pinterest because you can like, once you find something that you like, it will just know based on what you liked that it will give you a pretty good, if you click on that picture, it'll give you like a pretty good, like accurate of like other pictures that you might like. And so you can really just kind of go down like the, the, the what's it called? Like the Alice, what, just going down the hole. Rabbit anything. hole. <laughs> Rabbit hole, thank you. I said, I almost said Alice in Wonderland hole because I don't know why. But um, yeah, you can like essentially just like go down the rabbit hole and just keep collecting more and more and more of like art that you like feel that is really working and you like. And then from that, you can take that and then be like, oh, I'm not feeling really inspired. I'm not really making art. I like to just go down and just like start looking at it and just getting inspired by what I like. And then from there, just like taking things like, oh, I like this idea and this, and I like this idea and this. And it's especially helpful with editorial because ideas are constantly recycled. So if I'm like struggling with a concept, I might just go to my Pinterest board and be like, just kind of like work that brain a bit and be like, oh, I kind of like how this, maybe I can combine this with this. I'll, oh yeah, that's like an idea. Cause we always get stuck and we always just get kind of like, we kind of put ourselves on repeat of like what we're trying to, we're just like get stuck on the same idea. So it's sometimes hard to break away. And sometimes just looking at other people's art can help you break away from ideas. For sure. I mean, I think that we all sometimes need to reset every now and then. And I think you actually told me that texture is a really big part yeah. of your process now. And actually, that goes back to freshman year because I yeah. gave you a project on texture. So where's the connection there? Well, you're you're like, learn from you're all about texture. It's not one project. You're all you're all texture. It was like. Uh, I mean, personally, like CGI, I love texture because it's like you can you can essentially like get the, the feel and because you understand things like specularity and all this other stuff, you can like learn to apply and where it is. And it's like, oh, this now looks like can turn from sandpaper to fuzz to like, and it's just like people really like textural things. We like to see artwork that can you can just kind of like touch or taste or smell. And it just like really gets you involved into the artwork. So um, yeah, uh, I just think it's good in general. Like when you're following artwork, it's just good to like, not just follow like, oh, I like doing concept character artwork. I just only gonna follow what I think of as like concept character artwork or like, you know, DreamWorks artwork. It's like, it's good to broaden yourself and just really branch out even from illustration being like, I follow ceramics artists because I love, or glass artists or something like that. And I just love, the, the work that they make from that and thinking, oh, I love how it's like translucent here. I wonder if I could apply that here. Yeah. And tell us about this clip, which is you actually making your own references yeah. for textures in Cinema 4D. How does this work? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I love this. I can use it for textures and I definitely love it. Like for example, that golden metallic look, it's like, I can use that and just be like, oh, like, if I'm trying to draw something, I can use things as like reference to figure out how it actually works. Cause it's literally, it's literally using the light rays and making it accurate. So then I can just essentially be like, oh, I like how, you know, this metal looks and I can learn how it like reflects off of like surfaces and, oh, it's kind of like brown here, but it's yellow here. And it's like, it just really helps in some ways. And it just really helped me understand lighting in general and how materials, have like substance and be like specularity and things called Fresnel and fall off and stuff like that, which I guess sounds like gibberish when I say it like that, but it's, um, it does have its benefits. And I learned that just taking that, I can apply it to my paintings. And then I'm like, oh, wow, it just elevated it. Um, yeah. Well, do you ever use photo references or is this all just out of your head? 
No, no, no. I use photo. I use photo reference. Most of my stuff is normally out of my head, but when I do, but when I get into things like I've been drawing a lot of people more recently, so I use like references for like not like not like cartoonish people because those are more like geometric shapes. I don't really need a reference for that, like in that slide. But like my most recent stuff, like on my Instagram, it's like more photo or it's like more like realistically looked with stylization. And I need to a little bit know about like, you know, the zygomatic arch. What was that? It's like your favorite bone is the zygomatic arch. I always remember you saying that. Um, and it's just like little things like that. And you like kind of be like, how does it actually shape and form again? How's the muscles when I like, when I like do an angry face, what's the, what's the like, how's it tense up here and stuff like that? Um, yeah, that's like, definitely I use references for certain things. I'm not gonna like, I don't know how to draw a shoe. I'm gonna like look up how to draw a shoe. Yeah, too. That type of stuff too. Liam is saying, which artists and references do you find yourself looking at frequently for inspiration? We've looked at your references, ceramics and textures, but are there any particular artists or illustrators that Ooh. you like looking at? Oh, I think it just like depends on like, I go through sometimes phases and then I have like my favorite artists that I just like really like. I don't know if there's like anybody that like, I can say that I like look at as like the top of my head, but there's always like, there's always like maybe something I'm like, I kind of get drawn to if an idea and then maybe I like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there's like anybody I can think of that. I'm like, I can think of as really as a ref an artist reference. I know like I've, I've had some, like, um, he's like a friend of mine, Cesar Polizer. He's a CGI artist who does editorial work. And I really was digging how he uses like the square format and his composition is like, it's very like he can fit everything within this like frame of a square on Instagram. And it's just like, I love his, like how he does compositions in that way. And it's like very simple and very elegant. Um, and so I was just kind of like, oh man, I just like want to do things like that. Like, I just like want to try to do something like that. Um, he's like definitely like off top of my head. I know another CGI artist is like Jack Sachs too. He does like, he did some really crazy things too. And I sometimes I'm like, oh, I love how it's just like, eyeballs stacked up on top of each other or something. And yeah, he's cool. Yeah, I like both of the guys. Juliana is saying, can you give advice for those who are really just starting out? Uh, well, that's very broad, but uh, what type of advice, like specifically, I guess, um, like freelance? Well, just, or just in a nutshell, like, like in uh, general, starting a freelance career, what was the most pivotal maybe action or mindset that you took? Well, I guess like one of the things I tell people is like, you know, one, you should want to fail. So, and this kind of relates to style and stuff like this too. It's like one, you don't want to try to force yourself to have a style. It usually comes naturally through your process and you learn what makes you happy with your process and just kind of goes like this, this just feels right. And then like over time through this process you develop, you might gain a style. And then also you don't want to like pigeonhole yourself into like, limiting yourself with things and you should just want to like explore and fail at the same time especially when you're starting out um so when you're so you it's good to fail and don't think of artwork as essentially like this grandeur piece that you want to hang up on the fridge but instead think of it as i made this i can almost like don't don't attach your emotions to it just be like i made this i learned this from making this I can push that art piece now to the side and start on a new thing by taking what I learned and now applying it to my new thing. And you just keep doing that down the train. It just like keep going down. And you just you just gotta like learn to like, yes, put in your portfolio if you think it's good, but don't get like emotionally attached and be like, I wanna get a tattoo of it. I wanna hang it up on my wall. It's like, no, just like do it, move on. And then it will help you like, except failures when things don't look good because people might critique it. And if you get emotionally attached, you're going to be like, but I love it. It's like my thing. And I must be a shitty artist or, or terrible artist and blah, blah, blah. And you got to just move on from that. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at a project where we're looking here at the sketches, but we also have this work in progress video. Can yeah. you tell us what's going on in here? Yeah, this is like, I've been getting into using not just like drawing and painting in Photoshop, but I use like CGI to combine with it. So it's like I painted the face, but then I'll use like the shadowing from the CGI clouds and the water because I, because like you're on a deadline and you know, you're also on a limited budget. You're not gonna, I don't really want to like paint every wave. So I just decided I'm just gonna make it in CGI real easily. 
And then I just took that and then I was like, okay, and now I can take the lighting passes and be like, okay, let's use the lighting and the shadows here and just like put it here. And same for the clouds. And honestly, I like the effect. There's a few artists that do similar ways of working. Um, like an artist named Beef Strong, he does something similar to that and his it looks really cool. It's like, you can't tell if it's painted, you can't tell if it's CGI, but it's just like learning how to take shortcuts is really important in freelance too. So it's like, you, you, you want to make it look great, but also don't like spend a million years trying to make it when you're only getting paid like 500 bucks or something or 300 bucks. Well, isn't the turnover time for especially newspapers crazy tight? I mean, New York Times, yeah, yeah. isn't it like 48 hours, 24? <laughs> what is it like? Yeah, yeah. I've, had, I've had a job that was like 48 hours, but it's usually it's like about maybe a little less than a week. Maybe it's like five days, maybe a week. Um, and they just, you're kind of, especially me where I feel like some people is like very like pen and ink and they can just kind of quickly draw something. It looks like mine's like painted and I'm kind of just like, oh, great. Yes, I'll do it. But yeah, like, it's like, I have to sometimes spend, I fortunately have a process where I learned how to make it real quickly so I can pump out work a lot quicker than I used to. But, um, yeah, it's you have to learn how to take shortcuts and be quick and efficient with things. Yeah. It's Neftali not... is saying, have you had clients that were hard to work with? How do you deal with that? Yeah, definitely. I've had uh, mainly one client that I've usually actually had all my clients have actually been pretty good. I think it's just, you know, some people kind of as an artist, you might kind of it's good to not come off as cold and sterile and just think of things like, Oh, I make you artwork, you pay me money. Don't really think of things as that. Think of things as almost like you're working with an art director and you're collaborating and it's good to just try to keep a healthy, positive atmosphere. Um, so just kind of like, just sometimes it's, yeah, it's not easy to, sometimes I just want to be like, yeah, just here you go, blah, 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 blah. But if you can just try to like, make sure that like what they're doing is appreciated, you know, that you're happy to make the work. I did have one and he was like, very nitpicky and just kept wanting change after change after change until finally I was like, I can't, I, sorry, I can't do this. I just like, I, I felt kind of bad. He was like the only one. Um, and honestly, you do have to just kind of have a spine and step up. If, you, if it's like change after change after change, you have to be like, look at like, we be polite. Look at, we, we've been doing this for a while. I can't really do any more changes. I think we should renegotiate and be like, if we keep doing this, I, renegotiate the pricing on this then because it just kind of feels like yeah that's why you, sometimes in the contract you say i only do three changes and then anything more you put add a b onto yeah liana is saying how many pieces do you think a beginner illustrator should have before they do cold emails to art directors your work inspires me so much i also combine cgi and illustrations Ooh, awesome great to know um yeah, it's not really, I mean, obviously you probably want to have more than like three pieces, but like, um, it's not really about the quantity. It's not about like, I, it's more about like knowing that you feel like your portfolio, uh, just feels strong and, and doesn't feel very amateur. Um, I guess it's kind of hard to know when you've made that that leap. I think it's like you feel confident in your process. And once you feel like you know how your process is and that everything kind of feels like if a client sees your work and they go like, I know that this is like an Alex Kiesling work, I'm going to hire him because I know his style and I know I can feel like he can match with the thing. And I, he's not going to be unpredictable and give me some random other thing. Um, but yeah, it's not about like maybe necessarily it's like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, but if you want a number, maybe like more than eight though, like you say like eight pieces, more than eight pieces. I don't know. I'm just like saying it's not really about the number. It's more about like the quality of work that you're making. And then Alex, how do you actually show them your work? Do you say, go to my website? Do you give them files? How does that actually happen? Yeah, there's actually a few ways, depending on the client. So if I'm working for a studio, it might be that I would, if I were to send a cold email, I can send a PDF of my work. So clients, essentially, when they see your work, they're only going to spend like two seconds, maybe one figure about two seconds, three seconds at looking at work before they just go and say like, yes or no to it. So they'd be like, Yes, no, no, yes. They're gonna get like a big thing of emails from people from like 
potential artists and they go like, yes, no, yes, yes, no, 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 yes. You can tell what's good and what's not. And you just send like essentially like a PDF of your work with like, just like a, you know, just like a thing of your work. You don't go explanations and say like, oh, I did this with this and this, just your art pieces, make it well graphic design or use Google slides. Or if you're doing like editorial, you might send it like a MailChimp, which is, you guys should look up if you know it. it's MailChimp is great to like send like a nice, you can, you can do a nice email that says like, hi, I saw your work with this person at New York Times. And then you have a nice picture so they can, right when they open that email, they see your nice artwork with some nice little, better than just like a blank email, like a boring email. And then they can go like, oh, that's really awesome. Oh, there's a hyperlink to their, their Instagram or Twitter. Oh, there's a website. Oh, like this is great. Let's put them on file. Um, so that's like what you would want to do for like sending out to clients, PDFs, Google slides, MailChimp. Yeah. Matthew is saying, I'm a freelance illustrator. I also love comic books. I'm afraid if I start to draw comics art, share it in my social media, it would ruin my portfolio. Do you think diversity is good? Why would it ruin your portfolio? Well, I think they're saying that if if you do this type of illustration, all of a sudden you start adding comics, which is different than your illustration work. Is that problematic? I guess I can, well, and I guess I can relate it to other things. Because to me, like, I'm like, no, no, no. Like, if you're showing narrative, like, that's awesome. Like, show, like, you know, add it in. But I will say, like, I understand that feeling of being like, oh, I have myself kind of like as a brand and the set style. And then I want to do something kind of different, maybe, that doesn't fit what everything else I'm doing. If you feel like it's really throwing off, I you can always put it in a section on your website. Um, but I think it's good to... Don't, don't hold yourself back on it. If you want to do something, just like, yeah, go and work on it. And if you think that feels really out of place, you can probably still find a place on your website that doesn't feel like it's out of place. Like you can still maybe make a section for it. I don't know if you have a website or something like that, but just don't hold yourself back. If you want to do it, do it. Flower Child says, I'm in my last year of art school right now. Would now be a good time to reach out to art directors or are they looking for graduates? Oh, they don't care about graduates or not. That's like, that's a misconception. That's, they honestly, um, nobody really, unless you're working maybe for, no, not even, nobody really cares. Nobody cares if you have a bachelor's, nobody cares if you have a master's. It's really about your portfolio of work. If you think that your work is like, if you look at and go like, I think that my work, for example, if you want to do editorial and you say, okay, my work, it's like, it really not stylistically fits editorial, but it as a, it can fit conceptually with editorial pieces and be like, okay, it, like it can tell a story really simply. And like, it's very readable for, you know, for people to see. And it's very friendly for magazines. Like then, yeah, start hitting up and sending things out. It's never really too, never too, soon because if you send it out and they don't get back to you just take it as a grain of salt wait a few more months make more artwork and then send more art send more out of it it's very common like everybody won't hear like it's very common you won't hear back that's like just an accepted fact and everybody knows it in freelance when you send out cold emails you're probably not going to hear back so don't take it personally just hold on just wait a little bit longer do it more and then again you're not going to hear back do it again do it again so just just do it, persist, you know, you'll get, you'll get a, you know, they'll find you. Sister Bear is saying, how do you keep from getting burnt out from client work? Yeah. Um, I, that's where I said like CGI is really nice. So I might do, I go through phases where I'm like, I just do pure CGI or get really into like CGI and animation. And then I get burnt out from that. So then I go, I'm like, oh, I'm burnt out from this. So then I start painting and then I get burnt out from painting after like a month. Then I go back to CGI. And I found that to be really helpful is like being able to essentially switch between things. Like there's some artists who are like, I only draw, I only paint portraits and that's all I do. And I go like, man, I would get burnt. I would have an existential crisis of like, this is what my life is. This is all I do. So it's like being able to know that you can explore other things. One, you gain more knowledge and learn how to apply it to both those things. I can learn from painting, how to apply to CGI, and from CGI, I can plan to apply it to painting. uh, So then from those, and then I can also just be like, if it burnt out from this, I can move on to this, and it can keep me going. It's kind of like when you farmers, you don't just keep planting the same crop. You actually move the field so that new plants can grow, so that the field doesn't become, 
you know, desaturated from its the nutrients. You learn how to move on to new things and keep it going. So it keeps it keeps surviving forever. Dark Bulb is saying, as an illustrator and sole content producer, do you find that past max capacity of gigs is it necessary to branch into side avenues for financial growth? Wait, what is that, Juan? Like, <laughs> sorry. I, I I'm gonna guess. Do you have to do other things in addition to the freelance stuff? Like, you told me actually that you are now able to survive financially only on freelance. But you know, some people never get to that point. I some think, people have to have another gig. Yeah, I think, I'll, I don't know if it's most people, but yeah, I think maybe you could say most people actually rely on another gig, like a salary job, or, you know, they'd be like, oh, I have a job where I can work three days of the week on like, you know, and getting good, and it's a stable paycheck to keep on float. And then they use their freelance work to add that extra money in. You know, so it's it's very common. That's like, I know a lot of people that do that. That's why I said like, they might work for a publishing house to do like graphic design work, but then they do like their editorial work on the side or their children's books or something like that, which is really, that's what really helps. Yeah, I, I mean, know. I know very few people who live exclusively on freelance and even fewer people that have kids and a family and a house. I mean, it gets even more complicated once you have so many more financial obligations. It's very, very hard for a lot. Honestly, I don't think I know many people that are pure freelance that have like wife, kids and everything and we're living in New York City or something like that. I don't know. I think a lot of people tend to, this is like one of the questions that people have is like, once you get to like be like past like 30 or 40, you know, you don't see many like those illustrators. Everybody that's an illustrator is like in their twenties or something or like in their thirties. And it's like, where do they go? And I think like they still won, they still are doing freelance, but there's a lot of them that also have learned that because they have so much experience, they've also become art directors and they're a little bit maybe behind the scenes with some things too. And I have a few friends that have now been like, they went from freelance to being like now like art directors. And one of them is your past student, you know, and one of my friends. So you, you know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to say his world, name. Alex. It's a small <laughs> world. We're not going to say his Mr. Forbes 30 under 30. We're not going to say his name. Uh, yeah. Raindrops is saying, how were you able to develop your style and illustration? Any tips for beginners like me? Uh, well, like I said, um, don't try to focus, focus. If you're like in high school uh, and even early in college, just like don't try to don't think about style necessarily. Think about exploration and think about what you can learn from abroad, from just many things at once. Because um, if you set yourself on a style too soon, then you're going to pigeonhole yourself and you're going to be like, this is just what I do for the rest of your life. And it sucks. That's going to suck. And I know people, I know people who I will not say from college that did that and that's all they do. And they, they never once like went out and tried to do anything else. And as far as from freshman year, when I first met them to now, it's the, it looks the exact same. So honestly, but if you're like, if you are maybe at a stage where you want to get into client work, I would say like focus on trying to get like a process down and what your voice is as an artist. And then from there being like, oh, I love the, you know, I love printmaking. I love the repetition of it. Or like, I love being really loose. And it's almost like, uh, was it John Lieberman? Or, is it, or no, who, who am I thinking of? There's, oh, sorry, whatever. I can't say the artist's name. I normally would say it off the top of my head, but he does like really loose, like pen, pen um, sketches, but are very conceptual. You're like, am I really into conceptual work? Or am I really like into like, you know, drawing dragons and digital painting. And, you know, you might find that you get kind of shifted towards certain things and from their process and you kind of just start to lean into things and it just takes time. You just can't force it though. And I know Claire will say the same thing. You can't force style and you shouldn't force style. And guys, I get it. I know why people want a style because that's how people get hired and that's what artists are known for. But style should evolve naturally. It should not be you wake up one day and say, today's the day, I'm gonna get my yeah. style. It definitely does not work like that. Yeah, I honestly, recommend you guys, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, oh, we're almost over. I was gonna say that, yeah, from my early work, I didn't have any style from college. So I was gonna say like, I was not, don't worry. It's like, I have a style now, but I didn't have a style back then. I mean, look back to the charcoal drawings you were doing in my class. I mean, those are so different than what you do now. Oh, so yeah. don't stress about it, guys. Just let it 
take its own natural path. Alex is on Instagram, so you guys can check him out. And he also has a website and all of these links are in the video description below. And our prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And after the stream, I'm going to be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord in the post live streams channel. Alex, I don't know if you figured out if you got into our server or not. I don't know if it's gonna happen tonight, but anyway. No, I'll try, I'll try to get on. I'm gonna see if I, okay. couldn't, I couldn't figure it out before because I'm not, I just didn't understand Discord, but it seems like, I'll, I'll see if I can get it. We'll I'm see if we on. can get him on. Either way, I will be in Discord. Those of you guys who have further questions, you can let me know there. The invite link is in the video description. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you to our top Patreon supporters who keep the lights on here at Art Prof. Thank you to everybody who came to the discussion, who asked questions. You guys are great in terms of really picking Alex's brain. And thank you, Alex, as always. You never thought back in 2012, we would be on a stream together, did you? <laughs> no. Well, I didn't know. Yeah, you, know. yeah I didn't, it's, it's been many years. I didn't realize it was that long, but I guess like eight years it's been a while. You're old now. You're, you're in the old people club. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, thanks you guys for watching. We'll see you next time.